It's a pleasure for me to be here and thank you very much for having me here because I love talking about what we do at the lab and, and, and I've been briefed that some of you are actually trying to sort of innovate the way you teach and learn where you are and it's hard to be on your own and it's hard to try and find people who are, you know, with the same wavelength and trying to push um, different ways for uh, delivering teaching as well as to encourage learning in a more deeper fashion. And this is what we do at the Disruptive Media Learning Lab. Um, just to set a bit of a context, um, I, I will just play a short video to show what we have achieved so far um, um, three to four years, um, not, not that long. And I, I'm going to give like, a short history of uh, where we were and, and in how, did, how did we get here as well. That would hopefully influence or inspire some of you in terms of it doesn't mean that if you are the only ones doing this, it's like um, there are people out there that you can uh, in inspire and motivate and uh, work with as well. The journey the lab has gone on has been, I think, really kind of fascinating. And if I try and summarise it, I guess, into three words would be the kind of the, the idea of kind of serendipitous sort of uh, engagement. I think the other word perhaps would be collaborative. I guess the third one would be action. This is a space, and I've seen it over the last day and a half, two days. This is a space where people are being asked to think about that. The disruption is a disruption of a model of thinking of a culture of accepting. The DMLL's role is to offer a safe space for staff to come and perhaps use our spaces to experiment with their students, to explore new ideas, um, which perhaps realise what the 21st century university could be. So, what the lab is trying to do is to work with staff and students across the university and provide a space for them to experiment and do different things and try and see whether they can actually improve the way they teach or the way they learn. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that if you think that what you're doing is perfect, it doesn't mean that we can't break it and then rebuild it and probably find something which is more interesting um, to do because sometimes when you have been teaching for a long time, you find that it's a bit boring, it's a bit semi semi so what we are trying to do is to try and help them to, to discover how can they redesign and reconceptualize what they do and to be fair it was not an easy journey um, we are the lab was supposed to be a four year uh, experiment and for the first one year and a half it was quite hard because even though we are calling ourselves disruptive however the university was very much against, you know, not following the red tapes and all the uh, procedures and, and whatnot. So in the end, we decided to just do it and apologize later. And it seems to be working. Because if you think, if you feel strongly about something, that you need to change something, do it. And then show to the organization how it is supposed to be done. And we managed to do it, and now this unit is a permanent fixture at the university and has been given a permanent uh, status uh, late last year. So it is quite encouraging to see that staff who are working with us are able to actually create new things, you know, try new things, and then if we didn't do it well, it's fine, we learn from it because we learn from failures, um, because we can't just do things right the first time. But this is one thing that we want to encourage everyone to do. And there are three different strands which are interconnect. So we are looking at flipped learning, not in the way that you might think like how flipped learning should be done in terms of you, know, you have to video your lectures and whatnot. Like. But what we're trying to do is we want to go beyond this. We are focusing on active learning. How can we encourage staff and students to be facilitator of learning rather than delivering it only. Um, and we are looking at how we can actually use playful and gameful methods to design new ways for engaging our staff and, and, and engaging our 
students as well as those who are working with us beyond the, the university. And of course, the digital. We are in a digital world, we have to make sure that we understand what do we mean, what do we mean by digital. How can we conceptualize the use of digital platforms? How can we make sure that we are not just using tools for the sake of it? Because one thing that we found at the university is the university would say you need to use this platform and no one, no one would want to use it because we did not include staff in the decision making. We need to make sure that those who are going to use it in the front line, um, they are the ones who are going to be included in the design of the whole process. Why do we need to use it? How are we are going to use it? And, and, and conceptualize and contextualize the use of different digital means. And just to show the, um, um, the breadth of work that we are, we are doing, we are working with so many different units at the university, different departments, uh, teaching departments, professional uh, services, and we are still working with people beyond the university as well, trying to see how we can actually adapt and adopt what we are doing beyond the university, and how can we learn from people like yourselves and it's a shame that uh, yesterday I was like um, looking through the um, door and everyone was speaking German. I said, I don't understand what they're talking about, but I think it's interesting. So, <laughs> um, so I, I love to learn from people like yourselves and people from everyone around the world and how did they innovate and make teaching creative and how can we help them and how can we work together? And as, as I said, we are working with staff and students, and it's quite interesting to see how ready they were in terms of um, working towards designing new ways for teaching that would help them in terms of their workload, in terms of you know, how they engage with the students and whatnot. But of course, in the beginning, some of them are saying, why do I want to add more work on top of what I'm doing now? I'm working 150% for the university. And I said, if you invest more now, you would be able to reap the harvest after. It's that you would be able to you know, spend less time in preparing for content, but focusing on interacting your students and, and engaging them in a different experience. And it's quite interesting to see you know, how mindsets can be changed because you can't change practice immediately. It's a mindset that, that, that you need to change. You need to make sure that you show how it is being done, how interesting it could be, and how they themselves can actually practice the same methods that you have used. And motivation is the key thing. Not only motivation for the students, it's motivation for the lecturers, for staff across the university. How do we encourage them to be more positive in the way they deal with you know, a lot of um, um, work that they need to do for the university paperwork examination and whatnot. And, and assessment is one of the key things that we are still working on in terms of how can we change the traditional approach for examination and turn it into something which is more interesting and formative and something that is continuous and more fun for both the lecturers as well as for the students. And this is why we are looking at methods like gamification and playful learning and all sorts of different approaches that we think might help us design experiences. Because there are people from different background, people from different uh, views and perspectives of what innovation is. Some people say, that, okay, I want to stick to what I know because this is what I'm comfortable with. And there are people from the other end, they say, oh yes, I like new shiny things, let's just do it. Um, so we need to make sure that we work with people from different background, people who with different perspectives on the way we in innovate and redesign teaching and learning, because not everyone will be you know, in agreement with you. And I've seen this in, in the way that we work at the universities. There are still people who are saying, mm, it looks fun, it looks nice, it works for someone else, but I think I will just stick to what I know. So we are still working on them. So, um, so that's why I think it is important to try and think First and foremost, how can we create this experience for staff and students that will encourage them to be more open with 
innovating the way you teach and learn? Right? How can we learn from different experiences created in possibly in the entertainment industry or possibly in different sectors? How can we learn from them and then create something or remix it or repurpose the same experiences but in teaching and learning? So we've learned that in games, we've learned that in using existing entertainments of uh, uh, programs, for example, escape rooms and something like that to help us to get people to understand about the relationship between different learning resources. I'm sure that everyone is interested in digital learning and online learning and whatnot, but I always believe in contextualizing the use of online approaches in a more uh, simple way for people to understand. Um, it can be a hybrid approach where a hybrid learning approach deals with figuring out what would be the best resources that I can include in my teaching rather than I'm going to go for online learning straight away. Online learning is fantastic. The university is going for full online for some of the courses that, that we do. But the way we design it, we are looking at storyboarding, we are looking at different ways for ensuring that the experience that we want to create on an online platform is going to be enriching and empowering. And it's not just a space where you want to store stuff, like what, what we normally do for flip learning in the past. Keeping it simple. This is one thing that I always tell people at the university, especially in terms of working with people from different perspectives, different backgrounds, different uh, knowledge and skills and, 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 and whatnot. The discovery and onboarding part is key. How can we create this experience that will encourage your peers and colleagues where you are working to be involved with what you do? This is what we're trying to do at the university as well, creating a program that will make it easier for someone to understand, oh, how can I use games in my teaching? How can I create my own games to teach? Or how can I use open web or open educational resources in my teaching and learning? to help them to understand how to contextualize the use of those resources rather than giving it to them on the plate, saying that, okay, this is what you need to use, go away and use it. Um, so discovery and onboarding uh, uh, um, stages are key that will allow someone to practice it and learn from it, and then they can actually master it. So this is like one of the key things we are looking at and this is taking inspiration from gamification and uh, playful learning in trying to get people to onboard with what, with what you do. It doesn't have to be a game anyway. It just has to be something simple for people to understand how to get on board and how to discover new things and how to practice it and then master it. So co-creativity in that sense is key. We need to get people to be involved with us, because like what we're doing at the lab is we get staff across the university as well as students to work together to co-create new resources with us. So we are working uh, in different um, domains, different subjects and disciplines, and it's interesting to see staff from different disciplines working together and create resources that will be usable in their own disciplines when they teach. So we are using uh, methods like sprints. Sprints is a method that will encourage you to be more agile and more rapid in terms of prototyping products. But we are using it to prototype courses and modules and degrees and, and, and whatnot. And so far, we have done quite a lot in terms of the different modules, the different courses that we have developed with the stuff. We didn't develop it. We provide a space for them to come and have discussions and rapidly prototype those courses and get it through approval from the university faster than the normal process. And Game Changers, as uh, was mentioned by, by, by Christian before, um, this program came about because staff came to us and they saying that, can you create a game for us to teach A, B, C, D, and E? And I said, that, no, I'm not going to create this game for you. You need to create yourself. You need to learn why do we need to use games? A game is not just a tool, it's a method, it's a culture amongst 
those who are you know, uh, at the university, especially the young ones. So we need them to understand why do we want to use games? Can they create their own games? Can they reuse existing games to assist their teaching? And some of the other um, programs that we run in terms of trying to onboard our colleagues at university to discover new ways for doing things. Not only co-creativity is interesting, but creative learning spaces is interesting. We need to provide a space that will be able to encourage people to be more creative, to be more experimental in the way they do things. So we have done a lot of funky stuff, like using the bus to go around the different campuses that we have. We have four campuses in the UK, so we travel from one campus to another um, to really encourage staff and students to be on board with the idea of being creative, because creativity is one of the key skills that is required in 2020. And as you can see, some of the spaces that we have uh, at the lab, as well, and Christian has been there, and these spaces have been used in so many different ways, and they are always busy. And it's quite interesting to see students there being very noisy, but they are actually doing project work and, and whatnot. And it, it's quite encouraging to see the space being used in a more creative way. And this is how we want to reconceptualize the use of a library, because we are on the top floor of, of the library. And we have just recently redid the second and the first floor to encourage more workspace for students to really engage with each other, engage with the lecturers in, in a different way. So think about creative spaces. It doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to be a space where people know this is a place they can play with different ideas. This is a, a space where people can experiment. I know that in some cases, possibly the organization will not allow that. The organization said you need to focus on what you're paid to do type thing. However, there's nothing wrong in finding a few people at the organization who have the same interest and start a focus group and start your own group in trying to push different ideas and then show it to the organization how it can be done. And not only, the phys not, 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 not only physical spaces can be creative, but online spaces as well. The open web. We need to encourage our students to know how they can actually uh, provide a space for themselves beyond the university, beyond the school, beyond you know, where, where they are to really create portfolios for themselves and use online spaces in a creative way and taking back control of their own content. So this is what we are trying to encourage with students at, at the university to create their own content while they are at the university. Any assignments they have um, some of the lecturers are actually using this, as you can see. The students are actually using it like a lot. Um, they use it to, uh, instead, instead of writing essays, they would use such websites to actually create content. And this is an open web, so you own your own content in this particular web. For example, the men's is one of the projects that we are very much involved in. And we need to encourage core creativity and core creative uh, and creativity within an online platform as well. So there are a lot of different ways for doing this, and I'm happy to see that everyone is using Pigeonhole. It's quite an interesting, a good you know platform to use, and there are a lot of different uh, platforms out, out there like Padlet and so on and so forth. And can we connect the both, physical and digital, right? Um, I'm not really interested in using, say, physical only on its own or digital only on its own, because we need to make sure that we will expose our learners and our lecturers or our staff to different ways for creating stuff, new ways for being creative with the way that they uh, uh, do their own work and, 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 and whatnot. So we are interested in looking at hybrid spaces. How can we create this? How can we create something which is more pervasive? So we have different projects at the, at, at the university which, which are looking at spaces like this. For example, the use of escape rooms where we would lock two groups in two different rooms and they can only communicate via Skype. And there are a lot of different online stuff in the rooms for them to solve. 
And that gives them an, a, a good mix of both a physical space where they interact with one another, interact with physical artifacts, and they can interact with online artifacts as well and be more creative in problem solving. So that is one example of the, the sort of things that we are doing. And also some of the stuff that we are doing at the university has informed our external projects as well. And I, I, can, I can talk about that later on. So creativity is key. In 2020, it is in the top three. These is expected skills that our graduates or our students should have. And regardless of what disciplines you are, as you can see, there's nothing there that is saying math, physics, engineering, so on and so forth. It's all about the skills. It's all about the soft skills that you need in order to be a lifelong learner, in order to be someone who can be effective beyond uh, the formal education that you have. So this is one of the key things that we are looking at in terms of critical thinking, complex problem sol solving, and especially number six, emotional intelligence. Some of our students at university, they don't have that possibly because they are, you need to have empathy in order to be more connected with the things that you learned and how can you actually use what you learned to contribute to the community and whatnot. So these are the things that we are looking at. So based on what we have done in terms of being creative individually and being co-creative, we have created so many different toolkits. Because one thing that we believe in, we need to share what we have done. And we need to share what we have done for free. If we want to change the way teaching and learning are being done, we need to provide all this and we can't keep it to ourselves. That's why I quite like summer schools like this when you are sharing what you are doing in your own organization and everyone can actually take inspirations from them. And this is what we're doing as well. So on the website for the lab, uh, there are a lot of different toolkits that you can download for free. You can use it for free in any way you want. And it is uh, under the Creative Commons license, so it's free for you to use. And the drivers. So here I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the impact of the work that we are, that we are doing in terms of you know, being disruptive, do things and apologize lesser. And if you did it wrong, then you'll be like, you know, it's quite hard to justify. Uh, it, it doesn't work because at least we learn from it. And we believe in the power of research, the power of development and the power of practice. So anything that you are practicing can be part of research and research can inform the practice as well. So we are doing all three and we are trying to do it in an agile way in terms of if we have an idea, we do a bit of research about it, create something with the staff, implement it straight, straight away and see whether it will impact the students or impact the way staff uh, feel about their work and, 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 and whatnot. So we learn from it and then there's an inter iterative process, okay, what is working, what is not working, let's create something new, implement it, so on and so forth. And because of that, that we managed to sort of look at the timeliness of the problems that we are trying to solve to ensure that, you know, things are being done with the staff and it would actually contribute to what they are trying to do. Let relationships is key, that people you are working with within the university and beyond and being inspired by existing work so we are doing a lot of work within the lab, testing different things and see how can we use it in different ways. So as an example, um, the research funding that we have received since 2014, we have, received quite, we, we have actually achieved quite a lot within that short span because of the fact that we're working with staff across the university, trying new things, and we actually work with people outside the university and get funding to expand the work that we're doing and implement it in, the, in different countries. This is just to show that whatever that you're doing has got a lot of potential in being implemented as well. And I know that funding is one of the key issues sometimes. So there are a lot of opportunities out there that will allow you to be involved in a consortium that can actually push forward your ideas. And as an example, at the lab, we are interested in the power of play, interested in creating something that will encourage students to engage with content better. 
So we create game changers. As I said before, staff coming to us saying, can you create a game for us to teach this, to do this? We said, no, let's just work together and co-create, right? So we believe everyone can actually create fantastic, interesting content because everyone is familiar with games, everyone is familiar with play. We don't have to be complicated about it, keep it simple. So with this, we have created a lot of different initiatives with the staff and they create their own items, they, they create their own resources and students are involved in the design as well. So this is the context. And you can go on the website and there are a lot of different resources, free resources you can download as well if you want. And our approach to show that it is actually informed by research and informed by practice. This is the researchy bit that I'm, I'm not going to talk about. It's a bit boring. Um, but this bit is more the practice bit. The practice bit is like we should not be driven by tools and resources and technology. We should be driven by the needs. Start with the needs. What are they? So we're working with the staff across the university. And then we create activities around those particular needs. And then we think, how can we make it interesting? So we include a lot of play mechanics on it. And then we think, okay, how can we support this? What types of technology? Is it going to be a digital technology or is it going to be a hybrid approach, a physical approach? So this has really helped our staff to really think in a holistic way. So they understand, okay, the reason why I'm using this tool is because these needs need to be supported in a certain way. So that helps them to have that mindset. Remember, I'm talking about mindset. Mindset is key to help them to understand the process. So, right, so from research to practice, development and whatnot. And looking at the way we evaluate it as well. It's like, what is the connection between the creation of a game with higher level thinking? We already connect with understanding up to reflection and application and whatnot. So this is something that we use at, at the university to encourage people to think about the process of creation. And from the research, the practice, and the development at the university, we found that there are a lot of value in the work that we're doing and the staff are doing. So we built a relationship with some people from Malaysia, because I'm from Malaysia myself, through the British Council. So they are interested to implement what we do. So we said, okay, this can be a funded project, perhaps. And because of that, we managed to get funded by the Newton Fund. So we're working with the Malaysian government to implement game changes in the schools in Malaysia. And we have been in the press and whatnot. And this is just to give an example that whatever you're doing has got a lot of impact, not only in your own area. If you keep on pushing, that can impact people beyond your own circle. And I think it's quite encouraging and encouraging for the staff who are working with us as well, seeing that the staff that we have been working on has got impact in Malaysia, in Trinidad and some of the other places that we are working with as well, because it's all about encouraging educators to discover new ways for implementing teaching, delivering teaching, creating resources for teaching. And another big example is from the inspiration from Game Changers and some of the other uh, programs that we have run at the university, we had an idea of how can we encourage learning beyond the classroom? How can we extend the learning from a classroom into the outdoor and into personal spaces at home? Can we create something that is more pervasive? So the idea came about before Pokemon Go came about. Um, so we thought about how can we encourage people to do a lot of different activities outside their own classroom into the outdoor and they can learn about history, they can learn about ecology, they can, they, can, they can play different mini games outside. And this is also based on our research of learning in an atomic way, learning in a small construct. How can we divide learning into smaller constructs 
and represent those constructs with different resources that is interesting. Can we place these resources in different parts of the city, perhaps, and let them go there and find it and then learn from it as well? So this project is funded by the EU Commission. Um, it is, and we've got 15 partners in different parts of Europe, and including Germ uh, Bremen. Um, and we are in our third year now, so we have created an authoring tool for teachers and educators and lecturers to create their own gamified resources. So the resources can be used within a classroom setting if they want to, or it can be expanded beyond the classroom into the outdoor. And it, it is being piloted in, I think, about seven different countries. Uh, the pilot is going to start um, in September. So we are engaging with about 5,000 students and stuff. Um, so let's see how it goes. It'll be something that you guys will be able to engage with as well. Once the version has been released, then you can give it a try and then, and then use it in your own teaching. So this is an example of how the small idea that we had at the lab, working with staff across the university, the research and the practice and development that has informed activities beyond the university. And this is how we want to encourage everyone you know, to do, is to look at their own work and see how can I impact beyond what I do. And that, that will really open up opportunities for you. So there are a lot of different projects within the uh, game changes, game, uh, you know, game, game food and playful learning. Some of the examples, I'm not going to talk about them. And the partners that we have worked with so far for the past three, four years. So there are a lot of people that are working with, not because what we're doing is fantastic. It's because it's some of the things that we're doing has got a lot of potential. And we look at this as an opportunity for us to learn from the other university. How did they do their own teaching? How can we learn from them and implement it at our own university? So there are a lot of opportunities for you guys in the summer school to actually learn from one another and, and, and implement something that you might think in, uh, is interesting for your own practice. And when I say that how can your work impact beyond the university, not just in terms of implementing it in different countries, in different institutions and whatnot. It's about social value as well. This is interesting for staff and students. How can we encourage students to be better citizens? How can we encourage them to think about, I'm learning this, I learn about my stakeholders having empathy, how can I contribute back to the community? Because we need to create better citizens, not just better engineers. We need them to understand that whatever they are doing has got social value. And as an example, the stuff that we're doing in Malaysia, it's quite humbling to work in um, you know, remote areas where they don't have access to a lot of different privilege that we have. And that's what we learn from it. Okay, how can we support people in this particular community using game changers, which is games. that the, Some of them have not played online games before. However, as I said before, keep it simple. Everyone knows how to play hide and seek. Everyone knows how to climb a tree and then, uh, you know, all, all those things can help inspire people to think about engagement and to think about creativity and whatnot. So this is one of the key things that we are pushing now in terms of social value. How can we encourage social innovation, social enterprise? Because seriously, even if you graduate with a first class or not at university, that doesn't guarantee you a job. So <laughs> we need to encourage them to be ent uh, social enterprise as well. So, um, and in conclusion, um, there are a lot of things that I wanted to say, but not enough time. Um, but just to encourage you that the innovative practices that you're doing in your own organization, you know, if you are people who can actually evaluate it and do research around it, as well to help you further develop what you do, there is a lot of potential in encouraging different people in your organizations or different people beyond your, your organization to actually practice the same innovation that you have. And in terms of keeping it simple, is to think about discovery and onboarding. How can we get them 
in the same mindset and help them to practice it and master it. And they would be the person who is going to help other people in the different stages of innovation. So this is what we have learned for what we have done so far in the past three years or four years. Thank you very much.